Warning, content from Security Kitchen Productions may not be suitable for younger viewers. Hello everybody, Joe Morgan here, and welcome back to my rewatch of the Matt Smith era of Doctor Who. Today we're going through Series 6, uh, plus the Doctor, the Widow, and the Wardrobe, so it'll be the Impossible Astronaut through the Doctor, the Widow, and the Wardrobe. Um, if you don't know how this works out, obviously you didn't watch my first video, uh, basically I'm going to be watching through each of the episodes and uh, taking notes the entire time, I, I, seeing as the Matt Smith era is my least favorite era of Doctor Who so far. Um, opinions didn't change too much last time. They may change a bit more this time. I don't know. But for some reason in my head, I remember being a lot more favorable towards Series 6. Maybe because right when I started watching Series 6, like from the outset, I remember liking it a lot more because I had a strong series opener, unlike the first couple episodes of Series 5. Um, but hey, I don't know. I know I'll be, for the most part, positive uh, with these first two rewatches. But hey, we'll see how it goes. Uh, yeah, all right, let's uh, jump right into this. Uh, gonna kick it off today with The Impossible Astronaut. So, I just finished watching The Impossible Astronaut, and if I sound a bit weird throughout this one, I bit the inside of my lip really hard before I started recording this, <laughs> and it really hurts, but you know, whatever. Um, anyway, so uh, first note I had, uh, <laughs> every time I watch this episode, and it's one of the Smith episodes I've watched a bit more than usual. I still have no clue what the doctor is doing at the beginning <laughs> when he's, uh, when he's under the girl's dress at the beginning. I, I just think it's really weird. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the implication there is. I don't know. I don't know what's implied he's doing. Uh, anyway, uh, that being said, I do like the idea of the doctor trying to get Amy and Rory's attention. Uh, I, I think that works nicely. Um, also like the idea of the doctor bringing the three of them together, and Smith, overall, when he does come in uh, uh, to begin his scenes with River, Amy, and Rory, I do like Smith playing, like, older Doctor. He he plays it really well. Um, that, and of course, uh, in the context of the characters, the, the Doctor and River song, uh, Matt Smith and Alex Kingston are fucking spot on at the beginning of this. Um, they play the scenes uh, leading up to the Doctor's quote-unquote death absolutely perfectly. And then I have, uh, in this next note, uh, written in all caps, uh, what I like to call a moth hole, that being a, a Stephen Moffat plot hole. In, uh, now, obviously, I, I, I complain about this in retrospect, really. The Doctor begins to regenerate after he is uh, after he's shot for the first time by the astronaut, and that should make absolutely no sense, because in Stephen Moffat's Doctor Who, uh, it, is, it is the Doctor's last regeneration, so... That makes absolutely no sense in retrospect, but whatever, it's a good scene. Um, the Doctor Death is, is brilliant in itself, I think it's really nice. Um, then of course we meet uh, an older version of, uh, of a character that we will come to know later, uh, Canton Everett Delaware the third, and uh, I really like that scene where he comes in with the gasoline and they have to burn the Doctor's body. Again, everyone just plays the scene so perfectly, I, I adore it. Um, let's see, um... Oh, then, uh, then River and uh, notices that that they all had like the same envelopes, and uh, they're trying to figure out what the first uh, numbered envelope is. I love that scene. It, it's probably my favorite scene in the entire episode. One of my favorite Matt Smith era scenes as a whole. When they go into the diner and the Doctor is revealed after he comes out with the straw. I love that scene so much. And while I'm on the topic of it. Murray Gold's score in that scene is so good. Murray Gold's actually pretty restrained in this one as, as far as his typical big bombastic scores. Um, he, he's pretty good in this one. I do like that the Doctor isn't completely oblivious to why River, Amy, and Rory are all on edge. He, he is suspicious, and I feel like... The only complaint I would have with it is I feel like the Doctor would be... would, would catch on to why they're all nervous a bit quicker. B quicker? Yeah, quicker. Um than he does. I feel like the Doctor himself would figure out that it's older Doctor much faster. Because if I remember correctly, he doesn't even know that it's older Doctor by the end of the story. But anyway. Smith's a bit uh, darker in the TARDIS scene when he's uh, when he's first talking to River, Amy, and Rory. When he's 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 almost interrogating them uh, about like what they saw earlier and why they're so, so on edge about, around him. Uh, let's see. Then we uh, introduce uh, younger Canton, uh, Canton Delaware and, uh, and Richard Nixon. It's a great scene. Uh, I specifically love the dialogue. I even quoted it, um, where uh, where Nixon says to Canton, he, he says, like, you were my second choice for this operation. And Canton says back, you were my second choice for president. I love that uh, that bit of dialogue. 
Um, let's see. Um, Smith is a bit cringy in the Oval Office scene. Um, I don't hate the scene as a whole, but yeah, just Smith for some reason is really cringy in that. Uh, let's see. The silence design is creepy. Now we're getting into the silence. The silence design is creepy, but their their intro is a bit anticlimactic. I feel like we should, really should have built up to the full reveal of their designs and their looks. Uh, I, I think uh, it could have been built up better. And also, <laughs> I, I forgot how blunt I was with this note. The silence bathroom scene where Amy sees the silence in the bathroom and he kills the, the girl there. It's just a fucking stupid scene. It's just, it's... <laughs> I Again, I feel like the silence almost should have been fully revealed until towards the end of the episode. But anyway, um, there's a lot of Doctor and River flirting in this episode, and if I remember correctly, in the next one as well, uh, which is really cringy. River's plot in this is great, if uh, only, of course, if you know where it's going, or, or really where River is coming from as a character. I really like where, um, or, or really how Alex Kingston plays the character in this one. Uh, oh, <laughs> all these notes in succession just kind of lead into one another. Um... River has the uh, the line out. I'm quite a screamer. Now there's a spoiler for you. I have an all caps UG because <sighs> why? <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, I already pointed, pointed this out. Sounds are only built up towards the end, or at least built up properly, I should say. Uh, oh yeah, I already noted here. Just Canton's just a great character. I just really enjoy his character. Um, Rory is absolutely useless in this episode. Although the scene towards the end with uh, with him and River, uh, they're great together. Where um where River's sort of like contemplating where she's going in her timeline, and, sh and uh, I even quoted it says, "and I think it's going to kill me." Um, like where like where she'll see a doctor that she doesn't even recognize. Um, she's talking about that, referring obviously to science in the library, and I think that's a great scene there. Uh, you get some Canton uh, Canton development then, uh, where he's talking about why he was kick kicked out of the FBI with Amy. I enjoy that scene a lot. And then you have a really weird cliffhanger. It's almost like Stephen Moffat didn't know how to end the episode, so he was just like, and 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 then the astronaut came in, and then Amy told the doctor that she was pregnant, and then Amy took the gun and she shot the astronaut, and the astronaut was a little girl, and ah, the end. Everyone screams credits. It's just, it just kind of, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a fan of the cliffhanger for some reason. But that being said, I am a fan of the episode. Big fan of the episode. Other than the Dr. River flirting thing, I hate that. And, uh, and the really, uh, not out of nowhere cliffhanger, just like ADHD cliffhanger. I don't know. I really enjoyed the episode, though. So I give it, uh, so much so, I gave it a 9 out of 10. Um, absolutely love this first part. If I remember correctly, Day of the Moon is a bit weaker, but not that much weaker. Uh... I don't know, this is just one of the stories overall that I look at more favorably in the Smith era. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Alright, let's jump into Day of the Moon. And I just finished watching Day of the Moon. First note I had, uh, the flash forward uh, three months later and uh, and the Amy death at the beginning is kind of cool. Death, of course, in quotes. Um... I do love the bit of dialogue right at the beginning when uh, uh, when Amy says, like, the body bag is empty, and uh, and Canton goes, well, how about that? I, I just like that. It's cool. Um, and I just, I just love the idea of, of Canton hunting down the TARDIS crew. It's a, it's a really cool opening sequence, uh, and again, I just really enjoy Canton's character. Rory dies again, because why the hell not? Um, the escape plan is great. Trapping the Doctor inside, uh, inside the Dwarf Star alloy, I, I enjoy that a lot. And then... I did note, unless I missed something in the in the story, where how did the TARDIS get inside there? I'm 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 really confused. I just have noted down, uh, TARDIS from where question mark question mark question mark because I'm just really confused as of that. I feel like I missed something, and I feel like it was explained. I just missed it. So explain to me in the comments, please. Uh, let's see. Saving River, of course, from falling is a nice touch. I I, I enjoy that. Um, we. Obviously makes no sense, you know, with the, with the water splashing out of the doors after, you know, she falls into the pool. But, you know, whatever. It's a for the sake of effect in the scene. Uh, let's see. Oh, I do like the scene where the Doctor is um is prepping the TARDIS crew for the silence. Uh, it, it's it's really cool where, where he, like, gives them the uh, the devices in their hands and he, and he shows them the projection of it. It's a really cool way of setting up the laws of these villains. Uh, and also, obviously, you know, really... Uh, really shows us how the silence are going to be more effective in the series at large because 
they're, they're building them up so properly. Like they're, they're, it's laid out very clearly how the silence operate, what the rules around them as a species are, and and how our characters are going to interact with them. So I think it's really well set up. The children's home, then. Amy and Canton go to the children's home and start investigating there. The atmosphere is great, but, I don't know, just something about the scenes whenever we're in the children's home, it just doesn't work for me. I don't know why, I'm just, I'm really not, I'm really not dragged in by the scenes. Um, the the Apollo 11 reveal is really cool when, uh, when the Doctor is, like, inside there and the two guys open up the hatch and, you know, you pan out to the Apollo 11. I think that's a really cool scene. Uh, <laughs> shortly followed by, um, by a scene that I adore. I love, I love Nixon in this episode in particular. I, I found myself just legitimately laughing out loud whenever he came in. I was just like, that's just really fun to watch. Um, I love him coming in where, um, where like he gets the doctor away from the interrogation and, uh, and he's talking to the one guy. He's like, oh, you have a, yeah, uh, you have a baby on the way. And, um, and they do the whole, like, oh, a fine, uh, what is it? Uh, a healthy young American will do just fine. Like, I, I enjoy that scene a lot. Um, and the guy playing Nixon is wonderful. I wish I could remember the actor. Um, oh, back on the children's home scenes. Oh, I did point pinpoint why I don't like it. They really drag. Uh, just, I feel like we spend way too much time there. Uh, we, a lot of the information that we get from the children's home scenes could be crammed into a couple lines of dialogue, I feel. Uh, anyway, uh, I like Canton shooting on the silence. That, that is a highlight of the home scenes. Um, Canton, again, I just love Canton. A lot of my notes are about Canton, because he's just, he's an enjoyable character. Uh, next up... I, oh, <laughs> again, more about Richard Nixon. Uh, I just love the music that follows Nixon around. <laughs> just whenever he enters a scene, you have it start playing. It's really fun. It's really fun. Uh, I enjoy it. Um, I realize I worded this next note wrong. Uh, I put River being useful helping the Doctor. It's it's not it's not so much that it's a change that she's being useful. It's a nice change though. When you consider one of my big complaints with River last series was that she, whenever she would enter a scene, she would just be there to make everyone else in the scene seem significantly less smart than she is. Um, we're here; she's just like regularly interacting with the Doctor and everyone, and 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 being a bit more of an equal to them. So I enjoy that. Uh, lost my place in here. Uh, oh yeah, why are we still doing the Rory is kind of jealous of the Doctor thing? It, it, it's it comes in and out every now and then, and I remember like even when I was first watching this with her, it really bothered me because I was I was just like, why are we still doing this? There is absolutely no reason to keep telling this story that 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 we already kind of resolved last series. It's so weird. Uh, let's see, next up. Uh, I do like Rory uh, reflecting on him being a centurion, though. Uh, like, when the Doctor starts talking to him about it, he's like, oh, do you remember, like, all those 2,000 years? Um, and uh, and they talk about that. I enjoy that. Uh, next up, oh, Murray Gold never fails here. <laughs> I put a I am the Doctor in all caps because Murray Gold is I am the Doctor in all caps. Uh, that is just the Smith era as a whole. Just throwing I am the Doctor in your face wherever you can. It's very bombastic at the end. I despise it. Uh, let's see, more cringy Dr. River flirting. I, it, it wasn't so prevalent in this episode up until t right towards the end. They start doing it again, and it's really annoying. Uh, I do. Oh, I do like uh, the way the silence are defeated, where they share the video of the silence saying, you should kill us all in sight. I enjoy that a lot. I think that's nice. That being said, the fight scene, if it can be called a fight scene that that uh, that follows, is really poorly directed. Uh, you can't follow a damn thing that's happening on it. Uh, it's it's in it. it. It's really annoying. Um. Uh, then we focus on Amy and Rory because Rory is still kind of jealous of the Doctor, but not really. I I don't know. I, it's um. Uh, anyway. <laughs> uh. The do oh, <laughs> I do love the scene where um. Again, more Richard Nixon. He's a big highlight of this episode for me. Um, the Doctor talking to Nixon at the end, where Nixon says, like, well, I'd be remembered. And the Doctor says, oh, they'll never forget. I, I enjoy that. Um, and then you have the little jab of uh, Canton wanting to get married at the end. So that's nice. River kiss scene is cringe, where she kisses the Doctor. It's just... <sighs> there were a lot better ways to handle it. I don't know. I don't even think the kiss needed to come in this episode, though. I feel like there was a more natural way to build the Doctor and River's relationship leading up to that moment. I don't know. Uh, and then at the end, of course, we have a pregnancy tease for Amy, um, which 
I know I sound indifferent to it really is a good intriguing tease, but really it's it's only because I know where the pregnancy plot is going and how lackluster and uninteresting it is that I'm just like, okay, it's there. It exists. I remember being really into it though when I first watched it. And then of course you have the uh the tease of the little girl or the <clears throat> little girl regenerating at the end. <laughs> I love that because of the because of the the guy that plays the homeless person that talks to, <laughs> to River at the end there. I think it's funny. Uh yeah, so it's a nice tease at the end there. Overall I I like the episode less than I remember, but not much less. Uh, I'm going to give it a 7.5 out of 10. I still think it's a good episode. Just weaker enough than it's than it's part one to be annoying. But at the same time, it, it does follow on the same plot. And I do enjoy most of the episode. They're, they're, you know, the gripes that I do have seem a bit more prevalent th in my notes than they actually are. And it, it, that's just for the sake of, like, there's not much to talk about That uh, if I don't amplify my negative thoughts. I don't know if I'm making any sense here. I'm going to stop talking. So next up, I have The Curse of the Black Spot. And that is uh, that is an episode that I've never had a strong opinion on. So maybe being forced to sit down and take notes on it and finally critically analyze it, maybe I'll have a strong opinion on it by the end. Who knows? Let's get into it. And so I just finished watching The Curse of the Black Spot. Uh, here we go. <laughs> uh, first thing I did note, the direction is nice, and that stands true for, uh, for most of the episode. I, I like the direction. Uh, the atmosphere is nice. The first death is effective. I think it's built up nicely. However, it's immediately followed by a cringy Dr. Amy and Rory reveal. I, I just can't get into that. I do like the threat that the black spot poses. I, I I really do feel the the dread that uh that that the crew on the ship feels whenever one of them gets cut or injured in any way. Uh, so I enjoy that. And the siren is cool. Uh, it's a nice twist on on pirate legends. It just kind of gets ruined later on. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> the second death, um, which was very clearly supposed to be on screen, they cut away very quickly, because the effect when someone dies at the beginning is very cool, it's like the smoke effect, they turn to smoke and it looks really nice, they cut away and it's just really lazy, I thought I had to note that. Smith is especially cringe throughout this whole episode, he's, he, I, I don't know, I feel like he's not giving a lot into this performance, um... Yeah, just cannot get into this. And also, there's just a lot of cringy dialogue for the Doctor. I just don't enjoy it. Uh, then the Captain's son is revealed, and I, it's just the plot with his son just isn't convincing to me whatsoever. And it's it's supposed to be this big backbone of the episode that I just don't find interesting at all. Um, oh yeah, I, I, there was this nice little moment where the Doctor was like, okay, well I have a ship and I'm sure he could get us all out of here. And uh, And it was just the Doctor like suggesting that they just get up and leave and i i kind of liked that that was it was different um kind of steps away from the typical new who look at the doctor always be, always being there to save the day he's like nope just come on let's get up we'll, we'll get out of here i have the tardis um so i enjoyed that uh, and then obviously once the captain gets into the tardis uh i, I like him and the doctor's rapport i i enjoy that a lot when they're in the tardis i i, I don't seem to remember enjoying that last time um, oh, and then Murray Gold's score seems to be overcompensating for the lackluster script. Uh, it's it's not even a bad score. It's just like played up really loud, and it's just like wow, I can't, it's really distracting. Um, oh, I do like the reflection reveal um, that that the that the siren is hiding in in, in clear reflections. I enjoy that. Uh, I don't like the child actor. He's not very good, but we'll have far worse later on in the series. Uh, obligatory Madam What's Her Face cameo because I can't remember the fucking name. It's Kav Kavar Kavarian something like that. I don't know what it is. It's it's okay. It's there. <laughs> um, oh, then so not long before this scene, they reveal that the siren is hiding inside reflective surfaces, and that's cool. But then when they're on the ship and they're they're trying to get away from it, the crown falls out of out of the kids jacket or whatever i don't know the crown falls it falls in the ship and the siren comes out of it and they're being there's this downpour there's rain falling all over it that makes the crown not a, a clean surface and they specify that it does have to be a clean reflective surface because um the water that it came out of earlier was it was undisturbed water it had to be undisturbed before the siren could get out of the out of the water so the, the crown being covered in rain makes it not a clean, reflective surface, so I don't get how the siren was able to attack them then. 
And also, we then get into the 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 ship that the siren is healing people on and i just noted like in all caps this story does not need to be a pseudo historical like and and fuck the whole like sick bay uh the siren is really a doctor shit i hate that um and there are just so many unconvincing fake out deaths towards the end it gets really grating and also, who the fuck at this point is going to believe Rory dying? I, like, no one's going to believe it. This is now, what, fake out death number three for Rory in the Matt Smith era? I think. And it, and one of them just happened last episode. <laughs> Who's going to believe it at this point? You know, especially at episode three in the series. It's There's this big dramatic moment where Amy is uh, where Amy's trying to perform CPR on Rory, and it just... It totally falls flat because it's just not convincing whatsoever. Although I will say Karen Gillan is giving her all in that scene. I don't think Matt Smith is. Matt Smith is very clearly not into this episode. Uh, oh, and then we get silly Captain and Son adventures because the captain gets the ship and he's going to travel all over the universe with his son and <laughs> they have that shit. Then you have the obligatory like, is Amy pregnant? Is she not? Who ending? And just... Ah! <laughs> I swear, when I started taking notes for this, I was like, oh, you know what, I don't hate it, I was going to give it like a 6 out of 10, and then the episode kept going on, I gave it a 5 out of 10, the episode kept going on, I gave it a 4, and uh, my final rating here by the end is a 3, I gave it a 3 out of 10, because, wow, I finally have a strong opinion on this episode, I don't like it at all, on to the Doctor's Wife, which I typically like, so here we go. And so I just finished watching The Doctor's Wife, um, I love the character's preparing Idris. That was the first uh, first note that I took. I, I just love their performances. Aunt and Uncle, I think they are. They're so much fun to watch. Uh, the direction of this episode is just absolutely beautiful, much like the rest of the episode. Um, Idris is a lovely character. I just enjoy watching her. And House as an idea is just fascinating. I, I think he's wonderful. And also, Michael Sheen does a lovely job. Um, I love the Doctor trapping Amy and Rory in the TARDIS. I don't know. That just seems like a very... It seems like more of a classic Doctor move, and uh, I, I enjoyed that bit a lot. Because the Doctor is on his, on his own little personal hunt in this episode, and it's his own, his own story, so I, I appreciate that. But also, it gives Amy and Rory the chance to do their own thing, and they have quite the, quite the interesting plot in this. I think most of my notes on this episode are, are about the Amy and Rory plot. But that being said, Matt Smith is fantastic in this episode. Probably his best performance so far. And maybe, may end up being his best performance overall. I don't know. He's he's fantastic in this. Uh, the Doctor and Idris have a great dynamic. I just love watching their rapport. Um, <laughs> also, I just love Aunt and Uncle just dropping dead. I, I, I loved their characters and just like them. It, it's It's got this sort of like morbid... It's like a black comedy, basically. Whenever they're on, they 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 offer some comedic moments. Obviously, with in obviously those comedic moments are in more dire stakes, but uh, but I enjoy it. Uh, they're more morbid, is what I meant to say. I do hate the Doctor calling the TARDIS sexy. That is something that just grates on me. I I don't appreciate that at all. I do love uh, Amy, Amy and Rory when they're alone with House. Uh, then, of course, I noted, <laughs> I am the Doctor. Because <laughs> uh, Murray Gold just doesn't know how to control himself. Actually, he's he's all right in this one. There are just some some louder moments. I quite like the TARDIS corridors. I just like the look of the design with Amy and Rory walking uh, down them. Uh, then I quoted a line with the Doctor talking to Idris uh, of her saying, I always took you where you needed to go. Um, like the doctor said, like, you never took me where I wanted to go. And she always says, I always took you, took you where you needed to go. I like that line a lot. Uh, I love Rory's newest death. That's three episodes in a row Rory has died, but this is by far the best one because it not only does a lot for Rory, not, it doesn't even do a lot for Rory. It's definitely the most harrowing and just downright fucking disturbing Rory deaths. Um, but also it does a lot for Amy. It really puts her through a lot. So I appreciate that. I love the visual tricks with the corridors. I love, like, Amy getting trapped in blackness while Rory, like, goes forward and, he, and he's not able to see what she is. So I appreciate that. Um, I do actually appreciate the, the Davies console room when they get into that, the the Eccleston tenant console room. I like that. It's it's not too grating of a, of a fan winky reference. Uh, I love the Doctor's conversation with House. Um, obviously, a, a commonly quoted line from that is... Uh, uh, when, when House says, uh, I've killed hundreds of Time Lords, and the Doctor says, I've killed all of them and all that. I appreciate that a lot. I, I think it's a, it's a really nice moment. 
And then in all caps, I just put Smith is just absolutely on fire. He fucking kills the last scene where, uh, where him and Idris uh, defeat House. And also, House being defeated is really satisfying. I'm never typically fulfilled when I uh, when I have when there's a villain death in New Who. I'm just like, okay, well that happened. But this was just satisfying. House put our characters through a lot, and thus his defeat combined with an amazing performance from Matt Smith. Really just owning that scene, it's it's wonderful to watch. Uh, obviously, Final Conversation is beautiful between the Doctor and Idris. I love that so much. Um, especially uh, Idris saying, I just wanted to say hello. Loved that. I've never been so emotionally impacted by this episode. I don't know why. Maybe just finally looking at it from a critical angle, seeing how truly wonderful it is uh and then of course i love the end with the doctor alone with the tardis it's it's a nice bit where he says um uh, i have a reiner wherever we need to go obviously calling back to uh wherever we need to go that that line earlier and there was absolutely no question by the end i gave this one a nine out of ten there is very little i don't enjoy about this episode and i'm surprised i never gave it that much note before i always thought it was really overrated and uh god i couldn't be more wrong about this one shit this was amazing uh just a shame that <laughs> that next i have the rebel flesh and the almost people oh god <laughs> i know i hate this one i know no matter what happens i'm gonna fucking despise these two episodes so here we go time to watch the rebel flesh so i just finished watching the rebel flesh <laughs> the so, uh, first off, a uh, note I took, uh, the hook of this story doesn't really, well, for lack of a better phrase, hook me. It doesn't really drag me in. The idea just isn't portrayed well. It, it can be an interesting idea, and the idea is there, but yeah, it's just not a good script for it. Um, next thing I noted, of course, the 11, I totally forgot Mark Bonner was in this. Um, so the, uh, big Finnish fans such as myself will know him as the 11 in the eighth doctor audios. So that's pretty cool. Um, he's actually one of the highlights of this story. Uh, uh, asteroid field looks really cool. Um, the solar wave, sorry. <laughs> I wrote asteroid field in it, and then they said it was a solar wave, and I was like, oh, I should probably correct that, but I said asteroid field anyway, so here we are. Uh, <laughs> uh the scenery of this story is nice, um, and direction at that matter, for that matter. Um, it, it looks, it looks pretty nice. Um, you know, there's not too much to comment on beyond that. Uh, also, a, lo a lot of the performances, it comes across like no one really cares about the script, especially our lead cast, uh, which really hurts and really is a detriment to the story overall. The gangers are a cool idea, but there's no enthusiasm put towards them. Uh, like I said, like the idea is there, but nobody is putting the energy in, in, into making this a cool idea, into making this an interesting story. So I'm just not dragged into it. Uh, Murray Gold is at least kind of downplayed, I noted. Uh, he's just, he's kind of there. I mean, it's better than being big and bombastic like he usually is, but, uh, yeah, he's just, you know, not much to talk about there. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> this is the first episode where Rory starts making self-referential death jokes, and that just took me by surprise. Like, I, I, I knew he did it later on, but, like, I'm still annoyed by the fact that it happens. It, like that that's not a way that a normal person would look at that at this situation. Sure, we've had a lot of fake out deaths for Rory, but like as a normal person, he shouldn't be pointing this out about himself. Now, let's see. Um oh yeah, all dialogue, uh anything that's supposed to sound important in the script just sort of melts through your brain because it's so uninteresting. The dialogue's not interesting and nobody's putting the energy into making it interesting. Um, let's see. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> then Rory encounters Jen's flesh head and it's actually pretty creepy. I was, I was actually kind of skeeved out by it. Uh, the flesh makeup is nice. It looks pretty cool. Um, Matt Smith so doesn't care about this script. Then, uh, we get an obligatory appearance by Madam What's Her Face. Um, then I noted, why do I have nothing to say? <laughs> Because I, I, I just don't know what to say. It's just so uninteresting. Um, and right after I say that, go figure, I have a note with the word interesting in it. There is an interesting duplicate story. Oh, here, probably should have read the whole note. There is an interesting duplicate story here, but it's so low energy. L l um, like the moment between the two Mark Bonners. It it's a... Uh, it's supposed to be interesting, and Mark Bonner is a good actor, but I mean, just, yeah, I, I just don't care. And then, um, 
Oh, and then the cliffhanger solid. I, I do enjoy the cliffhanger. But yeah, not much to say in... in uh, po- not much to say positively about this episode. I give it a 2 out of 10. And if memory serves, the next episode is ever so slightly better because at least it ends on a better note. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Uh, time to get into The Almost People. So uh, I just finished watching The Almost People. The Flesh Doctor's reaction to existing is kind of cool. I enjoyed that. Um, the two Matt Smiths, Matt Smiths, uh, look really shit next to each other. It's just a poorly done effect. Uh, back on Mark Bonner, because he's, again, one of the only highlights of this story. He has a nice little speech about his kid. I, I enjoyed that. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm legitimately laughing at my at this note. I forgot I took it. Um, Ganger Revolution. whoop de doo Okay, like, who gives a shit? I <laughs> Again, I'm just not sucked into this story because nobody cares about it. Nobody wants to be here. Um, again, in all caps, obligatory appearance by Madam What's Her Face. I still can't remember her name. <laughs> she just shows up in fucking everything, and it's like, why? What is happening here? Um, <laughs> I do. Uh, I do like uh, Amy's concern for the Doctor's future death, um, but that's been a nice. That's been a positive about this series overall so far. Uh, oh, <laughs> I legitimately forgot Rory was in the episode for a while because he just not he he not only takes a while to show up, but also like he's such a minimal part of the episode up until this point. Um, there is a nice little moment between uh, of tension between the two gens, like when Rory is faced with the 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 two flesh Jennifers. I like that. Uh, Arthur Darvel is really good in this though. I, I think he gives a solid performance, as, like more specifically here in the second part than he did last episode. Um, Smith is just the fucking worst in this. Like, even, like, even it's something that you think, like, Smith would, would latch onto as a storyline, like, him, uh, acting as the Doctor and, and the Flesh Doctor, you would think that Smith as an actor would really gravitate towards that, but no, he's just, he does not sell it. Uh, I do also feel like the supporting cast, if the supporting cast was smaller, I'd care more about the real Mark Bonner's death scene. That being said, though, the scene with the Flesh Bonner and, and his kid, I, I think that's a good scene. Uh, oh yeah, the TARDIS literally drops out of nowhere for the finale. It just kind of appears because it can. Um, happy endings are rushed. Nobody really... Everything just kind of like happens. The, the The ending can be nice, but if it was fleshed out a bit more, I think I'd enjoy it a bit, a bit more. Even Gold's score is rushed. Um, it feels like one of the one of the tracks towards the end is, is like a double speed. It's really weird. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, and then the Doctor's characterization at the end is really off when when he's interacting with with the supporting characters as he's sending them off to do their own thing, and 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 he's interacting with Amy, with, with Flesh Amy then. And also, I noted this. Like it, it makes sense story wise, but Flesh Amy just isn't well thought out. At least in in the characterization of Flesh Amy as a character and the characters around her, I I don't I don't I don't think it's very well thought out. I, I not not a lot of thought was just put into this script as a whole, uh, and because of that, the almost people gets a three out of ten. It's ever so slightly better than the last one. <laughs> Um, so in my mind, I think A Good Man Goes to War is one of my more positive episodes. To be fair, I also haven't watched it in a while, so who knows. Um, let's get into it. I am excited to rewatch it, because like I said, I have not... Oh, if you heard something fall there, I apologize. Um, yeah, uh, it's not it's not an episode I've seen in a while, and uh, I am quite excited to rewatch it, so here we go. So, I just finished watching A Good Man Goes to War. Cybermen are not fucking mindless drones. This this is really one of those episodes that gets on my nerve with, nerves with just using major Doctor Who villains as background pieces. It's really fucking annoying. Um, uh, Karen Gillan plays the scene with uh, with little baby Melody. Well, I enjoy that in the pre-title sequence. Um, Rory versus Cybermen, I just don't find convincing. Uh, Arthur Darvel is kind of giving it to the scene, but also like you could tell. The scene is just, it just kind of comes out of nowhere. It's there to just exist and also just to have everyone there at once. It, it means nothing. Um, oh yeah, the CGI in this episode, I know it was nice. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> this is also the first episode uh, where we encounter the Paternoster gang. And we meet, as I have noted here, in all caps, fucking Vastra and Jenny. 
I despise them as characters. More so Vastra. Vastra has absolutely no defining characteristics for me. Jenny I enjoy. Um to a degree, but also she doesn't offer much either. Vastra, like, just from the moment she enters, um, talking about how she killed Jack the Ripper and and how she ate him for some reason, she's like, I won't be needing dinner, and uh, it's... Uh, fuck what? <laughs> um, then the TARDIS shows up, uh, we cut over to Strax. Strax is just great, I enjoy watching Strax, he's a nice bit of comedic relief, and, um... But also, I want to make a note about a lot of the characters that show up for the very first time in this. A common criticism that that is that is met with people like myself that criticize the Matt Smith era is, oh well, Moffat had this all planned out from the beginning, and this is how his era, how the Smith era was always meant to go. When stuff like this very episode totally disproves that. If if Moffat did have this big plan for this episode of bringing all these characters together, then he would have introduced characters like Vastra, Jenny, and Strax long before this episode. Or Dorian, um, um him as well, the blue guy. Dor- Dor- yeah, that's his name, Dorian. I have it noted later here. Um, he would introduce them long before this episode, so that's really annoying Um, that like we don't know these characters at all, and it's supposed to be this, the Doctor's sort of like army behind him. Um, that's it just it makes no sense it really annoys me um oh yeah i do always like uh river and rory scenes i, I, I like uh rory going to river at, uh, at storm cage i enjoyed that a lot uh oh the cringy line demons run when a good man goes to war when we first meet dorian i don't like that at all it's it's very it's very pretentious very moffat amy's a bitch i have noted then <laughs> we meet uh we meet a character named lorna um who like apparently uh, met the doctor like the doctor saved her once on her own planet and um and she just wanted to meet the doctor again and she just starts talking to amy about the doctor's existence and <laughs> and <laughs> amy has a line i forget exactly what it was something along the lines of like do you have a gun um or, or like give me your gun or something along those lines and she's like because i have a feeling you're gonna keep talking and i'm like what the fuck amy she's the worst she's just a horrible human in this episode i don't get it um Oh yeah, uh, the headless monks. I wanted to know are striking. Especially when they start pulling down their hoods, and like I, I enjoy the makeup work on that. Um, then of course I have I am the Doctor in all caps because Murray Gold will never let us forget that that track exists. Danny Boy is back from Victory of the Daleks. <laughs> Fuck what? <laughs> there are Jadun and Silurians, part of the Doctor's army, I guess. Um... <laughs> The doctor has this line when he's talking to this big tough military man where he's like, I'm gonna I want everyone to call you Colonel Runaway when they talk about you in the future. What the fuck is this? Um Madam What's Her Face. Oh yeah, I, I'm I'm just co- obligatorily calling her Madam What's Her Face from now on. I found out it was Kavarian, but also I'm too scared to write out Kavarian in my notes because I'm too scared to tr- just like guess how to spell that. I know I could just look it up, but it's more fun to just write Madam What's Her Face at this point. But I wanted to note that now that we've actually had a full episode with her, I think she's a rather interesting character, and I, I enjoy her interactions with with Amy and specifically with the Doctor. There's a there's a scene where I, where I kind of got like Pandorica opens vibes, where she was uh, uh where she was talking about uh talking about like uh, the threat of the Doctor, and and it, uh, it kind of made me think of like the alliance from Pandorica opens, and and I noted back when I was talking about that episode that I do love the idea of all these alien races coming together because they're scared of the doctor's threat to the universe. So, uh, Kavarian's mission kind of reminds me of that. So I enjoy that. Uh, then Amy and Rory are reunited, uh, with their child. And that's a nice little scene. Uh, then the doctor, Amy and Rory are talking about melody. It's a nice little scene where they're talking over the doctor's cot, uh, that he had when he was a child. I enjoy that. Um, Oh, I know. Hang on. I quoted a line here and I can't remember the context. Oh yeah, um, there there was like some conversation about like oh the doctor's not a warrior and then some lady says then what then why is he called the doctor? What? <laughs> um, oh, I do like to see where the doctor is talking with Vastra and he's finding out that Melody is part time lord. I enjoy that, but maybe it's just the maybe it's just the fanboy in me saying ooh, but they're kind of like implying looms here. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, oh, the Dorian beheading scene is quite good. I I, I enjoy that scene. Um, oh, the mo- the headless monks as villains are threatening, but they're not shown enough. So I I, and also they're they're just more they're another set of henchmen that are just working under a greater villain. So I'm not really threatened by them as much as I should be because they are a cool idea. Uh, flesh melody is well executed when Amy loses flesh her flesh baby. I enjoy that. 
Uh, Lorna death scene is fantastic. Easily the best scene in the entire episode. Uh, the doctor is not a God. I noted there was, uh, how, why did I, why did I note that? There, it must've been in the river scene when, when the doctor's talking to her. I can't remember why I noted that, but I just put in all caps. The doctor is not a God. I, I just, I feel, and also just talking about a new who in general, I, I should just note that. Amy's just the worst person I have as my final note. <laughs> she's just, oh, she's so unlikable in this episode. In this episode in particular. She, she's been bad in the past, but, you know, this is easily the worst offender. I mean, this and the scene at the end of Time, uh, at the end of Flesh and Stone. Hate that. Uh, and you know what? Talking about it, I gave it a 4 out of 10 in my notes, but I think I'm going to give it a 5, actually. Um, I'm more mixed on my feelings than negative, so I'm going to give it an average rating of a 5. Alright, so that was A Good Man Goes to War. Next up I have <laughs> Let's Kill Hitler. Oh dear. I think it's worth noting before I get into the fact that I just watched Let's Kill Hitler that just today I started reading Bookworm, uh, the unauthorized and, unofficial and unconventional guide to the Doctor Who novels. And I was reminded of how great Time Worm Exodus is today, so maybe that increased my bile a bit. So I just finished watching Let's Kill Hitler, and oh dear, <laughs> this is just oh, this is so bad. This is this is one of the worst episodes like ever. Oh man, I forgot how bad this one was. <laughs> Jesus. So we kick it off with easily the worst opening title sequence probably in the entirety of Doctor Who. I was going to say just the Smith era, but probably the entirety of Doctor Who. I really can't think of a pre-title sequence, at least off the top of my head, that, that, that gets worse than this. We have this whole scene of, of Amy and Rory making a crop circle that says Doctor and getting the Doctor's attention with it, and Amy and Rory's childhood friend Melz comes into it, and she and she's like, oh, you have a time machine. Let's go back and kill Hitler. And it's like, ah, oh, it's the worst. I hate it. So... <laughs> Uh, that being said, after after um, the opening titles happen, I do like the flashbacks with Amy, Rory, and Mel's. I enjoy that. I like the the I like I like just seeing them as genuine people. Uh, I, I enjoy that. Uh, why do we need the whole micro human plot? I forget. I, they probably had an actual name that I've just I was just neglecting the entire time. The the sci fi element of what should have been a, a regular historical. The only sci fi element you really need in this episode is Mel's slash River because. I don't know. Maybe when you set a story in Nazi Germany, you kind of take advantage of the fact that your story is set in Nazi Germany. Not just have Hitler there in a scene, shove him in a cupboard, have the gag where Rory fucking punches him, and the doctor accidentally saves him, and we have a funny little gag of, ooh, I just accidentally saved Adolf Hitler! <laughs> Isn't this fun? Fuck this episode. Jesus Christ. Um... Uh, I think I covered most of my notes. I was just doing that off the cuff. I just totally ignored my notes there for like a minute. Another un oh, another unconvincing historical setting. I was thinking back to Victory of the Daleks, like how that didn't portray a realistic World War II. This is very similar to that. Um, guy playing Hitler just is not convincing. I don't buy it whatsoever. Um, but that being said, he didn't get to play... He didn't get to do like a full performance as Hitler. So like... Maybe there was the potential there, but he's shoved out of the episode after, like, five seconds. Not five seconds, that's exaggerating, of course. Um, this entire episode is just YouTube clickbait. Let's kill Hitler, not, <laughs> parentheses, not clickbait. <laughs> uh, it's just, oh, it's horrible. Uh, the River Reveal, I will say, is well written, however it is not poorly acted. Sorry, however, it is poorly acted. That's what I meant to say. It's well written, poorly acted. Uh, that uh, river reveal, of course, I mean saying when Mel's is shot and she starts regenerating into river. Then, um, oh yeah, when Alice Kingston actually comes into the play as as uh, as River, just endless cringe. It's just right when she regenerates. It's just one of the worst one of the worst regeneration scenes I've ever seen. Right up there with um with the general death in Hellbent. I hate that. Um, <laughs> uh, 
so it's worth noting this episode is written by uh by Stephen Moffat, and I kind of related the the whole scene where um where the Doctor and River are doing like oh I anticipated you to do that and uh um like well like with the guns oh so I took all the bullets out of the gun and so I switched the gun and I switched it with banana, I kept thinking to curse a fatal death. <laughs> Because you were like, oh, I anticipated you going back, uh, going back in time to the architect and telling him to do this. So I, so I did this, and I went back in time with the architect, and I kept thinking Curse of Fatal Death, um, which works in a comedy spoof of Doctor Who, not an actual Doctor Who. So yeah, bad scene, but funny nonetheless. Uh, <laughs> I did like the scene where River sasses the Nazis, going going like to the um, Jewish disabled gay bar mitzvah, um, and I figured, oh, um, the Third Reich's a bit rubbish. How about I go kill the Fuhrer? And I enjoyed that. Uh, nice, nice little line. Um, oh yeah, the voice interface when the Doctor goes into the TARDIS. I was really confused by that note for a second. Um, the Doctor going into the TARDIS with the voice inter- interface. It's supposed to be an emotional scene. Uh, it does absolutely nothing for me personally. The doctor starts screaming fish fingers and custard is supposedly in a meaningful way. I'm not, not impacted by it whatsoever. Moffat has a real problem, problem with writing women. <laughs> I noted this when, um, oh, what, what what was happening? Was it River going into, um, going into the party and saying like, I don't have a thing to wear. Take off your clothes. It's just, oh, it's the world. It's <laughs> Oh man, this uh, it's so much worse than I remember. Um oh yeah. Uh Matt Smith appears in a tuxedo and a top hat and uh, and, and he has that Doctor Who line. <sighs> I keep using the word cringe in this, but cringe is just like it's it's if I could sum up let's go Hitler in one word, it's just cringe. Um Micro Men, because I, I I swear they have a real name. The people inside the person I I forget what their name is. I'm just calling them the micro men have no reason to torture river because they made this whole deal about, Oh, well the doctor, uh, the doctor can't die here because we know his established death. Like, like, like in this time stream and we know that river kills her. So why are they torturing river later on? They, they do like the whole, like give her hell. And then they start torturing river. Like she's going to die. And it's like, but you just established that river and the doctor need to be alive because they die on this upcoming exact date. It's not very well thought out. Um, fake out Doctor Death is nice, and I, I, I do enjoy that. Um, I mean, it's very obvious it's a fake out death, but like it, it's it's a nice scene. And River saving the Doctor is, is a great moment. Then, uh, oh, then of course River is taken care of. She gets her diary. Um, the episode's wrapped up in a neat little bow, as neat of a bow as Let's Go Hitler can be wrapped up in. And um, and River goes off to a university and there's a sparkly music cue as she looks at her diary at the end. I don't get that. I don't know why I noted that either. It's not a significant thing. It just weirded me out. So that was Let's Kill Hitler. If it were not for the admittedly nice ending and the occasional line here and there that I do enjoy, it'd probably get a 1 out of 10. I'm giving it a 2 out of 10. Um, n- not like that's a positive thing at all. <laughs> I know, a 2 out of 10 rating it so high. Um, so that's Let's Kill Hitler. <laughs> so next up I have um, Night Terrors. That's the one. And I haven't seen it in a while. I I remember just not caring about it last time I watched it. So I am kind of excited to rewatch it. Any episode I haven't seen in a while, I'm just really excited to rewatch and to dig my teeth into. So looking forward to it. Here we go. So I just finished watching Night Terrors. I'm pretty conflicted on it, honestly. Uh, first note I took, Child Actor is god-awful. That is something that will always stay in my mind with this episode. I knew going into it this was going to be the key thing I complain about. And I always feel bad ragging on child actors because, you know, they're child actors. They don't fucking know any better. But, like, I've, I've seen... I, I know the potential of child actors in Doctor Who. I know that we could have gotten much better. And uh, this was just a poor decision. It, 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 every scene he's in, it just looks like they're shoving a postcard of what he has to say right in front of him. This is what you have to do. This is what you have to say. Come on, do that now. And you get, like, one single emotion out of him for the entire episode. And, um... It just, it's it's nothing. I hate it. Um, next up, uh, oh yeah, <laughs> I put three question marks after this. Message is telepathically sent to the doctor. The, the please save me from the monsters when the kid, his name is George, when he's talking. I, <laughs> it's explained, but like in the most just off the cuff throwaway line ever. It's it's really stupid. Um, 
Oh, and also this episode does that stupid um, innocent kid song is creepy thing with like the exact same song from Remembrance of the Daleks, which is my one complaint with Remem- with Remembrance of the Daleks. I am not threatened by that whatsoever. I'm threatened by the child. I think she's she's scary, but um, the song is just it's it's stupid. I, I I never like when shows and movies do that. It 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 doesn't actually feel as threatening as they're trying to make it. Next up, uh, oh yeah, the <laughs> the Doctor, Amy, and Rory arrive, and they start, like, talking to the residents, seeing, like, what's going on, and it's played as a comedic scene, it's not funny at all. Although I will say Matt Smith is quite good in this, uh, he's, he's easily the best thing about the episode, gives one of, uh, gives quite the charged performance. Uh, and I do like the guy playing, uh, George's dad, uh, I only wrote George's dad at first because I didn't realize his name at the time, but his name is Alex, I really enjoyed his character, um, the actor totally made that. Uh, Murray Gold is really shit in this one. I don't like the score of this episode at all. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> what's with the landlord subplot? There's this whole scene where where the landlord and 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 his dog come in and he like interrogates Alex as the doctor has this really quite lovely scene with George. Um, it's just a, it's it's a weird moment. <laughs> it just kind of comes out of nowhere. You got this landlord subplot. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, uh, oh yeah, the doctor has this nice little line when he's talking to Alex. Uh, uh, I just have quote, "Monsters are real." Um, I wrote that the line is excellent. Um, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but I, I'm sure it was really good, even though I just finished watching the episode. <laughs> um, oh, the doll designs are quite creepy. I really like them. Um, I don't remember being as creeped out by them as, as I was this time around. Um, but yeah, I, th- I find them quite creepy. Uh, see, oh yeah, there's that whole scene where the landlord guy, guy uh, is next to his dog and he gets, like, sucked into the floor. The CGI in that scene is god-awful. Uh, I felt the need to, ro- to write again that the child actor is capital letter so bad. Because he really is. Um, oh, and then the, the landlord guy gets attacked by the dolls and he gets turned into a doll himself. And the transformation, the makeup, and the CGI leading into it, it looks so good and so fucking creepy. I was legitimately scared. Which is not a feeling I get from New Who Horror episodes, let alone Mark Gatiss episodes. <laughs> uh, and then not long after that, Amy also gets transformed into a doll, and it would have been cool to have seen a full transformation for her, because the ma- the makeup looked creepy enough on the other guy as he was transforming. I would have liked to see it on Karen Gillan. But they cut away, unfortunately. There is high tension in the climax. I do like the scene where uh, where Alex and the Doctor are being chased up the stairs by the doll and the dolls and they meet up with Rory. Nice tension in that moment. I do like the moment where Alex saves George. It's a nice little scene. And, uh, oh, <laughs> then after the day is saved and everything, we do, we catch up with um uh, with Alex's wife uh, later on in the episode. And George has this really obviously dubbed in line as he's, as he's, as he's eating a sandwich. <laughs> it's just like one word. And it's like, I didn't see his lips move at all. <laughs> and he's like right there. It's so weird. Um, the doctor just kind of fucks off then. It's really weird. And just kind of, he just literally just runs out. I'm like, Okay, um, and then we have a really weird ending for the episode of of like the the song the dolls dolls were singing the entire time, like foreshadowing the Doctor's death, because you know obligatory story arc. And I think the entire time I was writing my writing my notes for this, I was giving it a four out of ten. I'm gonna say a five though, because much like my Good Man Goes to War thoughts, I think I'm definitely more mixed on it than I am negative. So I'm going to give Night Terrors a 5 out of 10. So next up I have The Girl Who Waited, and again, another episode I haven't seen in a really long time, really worth reappraising. In my mind, I remember knowing that people loved it a lot last time I watched it, and I was like, it's not that good. But who knows, maybe looking at it with a critical eye, I may appreciate it a bit more. So yeah, here we go. So, I just finished watching The Girl Who Waited. Uh, The intro is pretty rushed for such a good story i always kind of forget that, in, that the intro of the story just kind of gets shoved in your face they're just like oh we're on this planet like the episode literally opens with the doctor just repeating the name of the planet they're going to to rory and amy just over and over again just to like establish where we're going it's like okay now here we are and let's go out of the TARDIS and now amy's lost and okay what are we gonna do Woo! that being said the, the, the concept of the episode is fascinating uh amy getting lost from them uh, i think it's great the rules of the setting are very well established, if uh, if that makes any sense. Like, the rules of, of where we are, like, how this place works. Yeah, I, I like the way it's written in. 
Um, oh, the lack of a dialogue works wonders for the story. Um, really realizing the strengths of the actors at hand here, and I think um, I think they all do a phenomenal job. I love the Doctor um, being forced to be an outsider for the story. Not only is not only does it give Rory and Amy a lot of room to breathe as characters, but also it allows Matt Smith to be a bit more reactionary rather than directly within the conflict of the episode, and I enjoy that. <clears throat> Uh, oh yeah, the garden scenery is, fa is is not fascinating. Beautiful. Um, I love when Amy walks into that setting. It looks wonderful. Murray Gold takes a while to find this episode, like where it is and what it, where it's going and what it's doing. But once old Amy enters, he's absolutely spot on for the most part. Uh, old Amy's dialogue is a bit too blunt to start. You know, she she just straight up states very broad things like "I hate the doctor." Like she, that's an actual thing she says. Just "I hate the doctor." Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. You know, I feel like there were better ways to uh, hint at that and tell us that information instead of just bluntly stating it. Although Rory's dialogue is perfect. I think he's one of the best parts of the episode. I really believe uh, 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 Amy's character change, like after she was lost and how we got to this point, I think I find it really believable. I do love the moment where um, where uh, the, the Amy's first see each other. They both realize that, that they're there. I, I enjoy that moment, and Karen Galen plays it wonderfully. Robot Rory is stupid. Just thought I'd note that. It's just not... not it's not even funny. Like It's kind of written in as a funny thing, but then it's also supposed to mean something later on. It's just stupid. I love the Doctor lying uh, about the paradox, about the two Amy's being together. I love that bit so much. The music there is, is kind of unsettling. Um, is specifically more so in the scene right after when the two Amys finally meet each other. It's it's very unsure, and and that's the feel of the episode. I like Rory and the and the Amys working together to get back to the TARDIS, and of course I just adore the Doctor's betrayal. I mean, anyone that knows me and knows my opinions on morally questionable Doctors knows that I'm absolutely in love with this scene. Um, I love. Rory finding out that the Doctor lied to him. I love the way Matt Smith plays the scene. It's probably one of his best performances. I adore it. Um, Arthur Darville and Karen Gillan are perfect in their goodbye scene um, when old Amy's outside the TARDIS and, and, and Rory's saying goodbye. I love that bit. Um, old Amy didn't need a send-off, I noted. I, th I found that a bit odd that they gave her one final scene with the robots when really old Amy's fate should be unimaginable and also shouldn't be shouldn't be shown because we know because the idea there should be that Amy that version of Amy at least doesn't exist anymore. So once so once we kind of disregard her from the plot, we don't need to show her having an actual ending to her character and fighting the robots at the end there. Kind of makes no sense that it's there, but whatever. And of course I love the last scene uh, with the Doctor Rory and Amy waking up. Love that bit so much. Gonna give this one an eight out of ten. Um not quite a nine. It has some really nice moments, but but it is, you know, it falls into some Smith tropes and it is a bit clunky sometimes. So next up I have the God Complex, and I'm really excited to rewatch it. Not only have I not seen it in, in a couple months, um probably over a year now. Uh, but also I remember it being one of my absolute favorite Matt Smith stories. So um hopefully I wasn't wrong about that at the time. <laughs> So I just finished watching The God Complex, and who I was not wrong about this one. Oh, what a good episode. Um, the opening is so strong. The setting the rules of <clears throat> excuse me. Setting the rules of, of the setting. It, it works really well. And um I forget the name of is it Lucy? Lucy's the name of the character at the beginning. I think um I think her opening scene is really strong. The supporting cast is immediately interesting. I love the characters that the Doctor Amy and Rory first meet. Um, you, you just fall in love with them immediately. They're, they're not, they're, they're very, I don't want to say believable because obviously, you know, one of them's an alien. The other two are pretty standard humans. Um, but you know, I, I find their characters interesting right off the bat for me, at least love the dining room full of dummies. I think that's such a creepy look. Um, and, and first off, it's also a good time to mention, um, the direction of the story is wonderful, you know, setting the tone perfectly. Joe, uh, the character with the dummies, is a legitimately creepy character, <laughs> and it's a great scene. Um, and he has a couple scenes after that with him just kind of like taunting the other characters. Um, oh yeah, the doors, um, the doors within the hotel, are such an effective storytelling device. A simple, a simple storytelling device, but very effective, I think. 
Murray Gold's score, I think, is all over the place. It's one of the only downfalls of this one, but it, it's not always awful. Just sometimes it doesn't quite get what the episode's trying to do. So it's just like, is this a wacky scene? It, you know, it, not every scene needs to be scored, but whatever. Uh, let's see, obligatory Weeping Angel appearance. I, I actually think it's pretty effective. They they weren't overused at this point in uh, as as far as making cameo appearances in episodes, so I think this works. And also Amy dwelling on the angels appearing uh, before her is really nice as well. I think the Doctor and Rita are great together. Um, Rita is so obviously a pseudo-companion, and is purposely written as a pseudo-companion, which makes her um, her exit from the story later on perfect. Uh, oh yeah, I like Howie's transformation. He's, 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 uh, I think a pretty underrated character in this. I like his transformation into, you know, doing the whole, like, praise him thing. I think that's fun. Uh, the Minotaur build-up is nice, and speaking of, the costume is wonderful. I think it's a fantastic costume for that, uh, for that monster. I don't typically like the, the misunderstood creature stories, but this is an exception. I, I think it works rather nicely. Uh, I like the occasional security camera angle. You know, every now and then we'll just, like, Look at the scene. Look at whatever scene is going on from an outsider perspective. It'll be all black and white. I like that a lot. Um, <laughs> the Rita praise him reveal is cool. I, I like her sort of descent. This is the this is the exit I was talking about just uh, not too long ago. Uh, I love the Doctor looking behind his door. Matt Smith plays that wonderfully. Also love the Doctor being uh, being defeated and like down on himself after he loses Rita. I think that's a great bit. The Minotaur chase is threatening, because, you know, like I said, the, the Minotaur looks legitimately threatening, and just cool overall. Child Amy appearance is great. Uh, typically, I would find that a bit grating, but I think it's a proper time to use Child Amy, and it, it works nicely. Uh, Doctor Comforting Amy is fantastic. Also, Horns of Nymon reference, because, you know, Horns of Nymon is great, you know, when they find out that the mine the, was it like the minotaur species is related to the nymon so i think that's cool um <laughs> then once all is said and done the doctor takes amy and rory back home and he got them a fucking car i think <laughs> it's a bit just odd um although and then uh then of course we get like a sort of fake out amy and rory exit it's not a fake out exit at the time you know i kind of would have liked it if it was amy and rory's exit I just would have really liked this if it was their their last story, um, but it's not, unfortunately. But as it stands, the exit is really nice and well done. Uh, great last scene, specifically between Amy and the Doctor. The God Complex gets a very confident 9 out of 10 from me. I could find very little fault within it. And speaking of fault within a story, let's talk about a fault of a story, because next up I have closing time, and... And I just finished watching Closing Time! <sighs> just... Fuck! Fuck, okay. Um, here we go. Surprisingly, I didn't have as many notes to take as I, I usually do. Maybe it's just because I didn't want to talk about the episode much? I don't know. I just, by the end, I was like, oh, wow, I took way less notes than I thought I would. Uh, first note I have, Matt Smith cringe, because when isn't Matt Smith cringe? That being said, we have a positive note right off the bat. Uh, the Cyberman reveal right at the beginning in the pre credit sequence is cool. Unfortunately, though, it's interspliced with the Matt Smith meeting Craig again cringe. I just... I would have liked it if, if the Department Store Cyberman reveal was just the opening credit sequence. You didn't need to reveal the Doctor to Craig in the, op the pre-title sequence. It's weird. Um, oh yeah, I noted then, James Corden is really phoning this one in. At, at least as a positive point of the, of the lodger, like you tell, like, tell like James Corden's having a really good time in the episode. Here, I, he clearly doesn't even want to be here. It's ridiculous. Next note I have, um, a solid note for all of the Matt Smith era. Uh, Murray Gold can fuck off. You know, because he uses his Murray Gold, oh, here's the zany, silly music, here's how you should feel. Isn't it wacky? Doesn't it make you laugh? Uh, then we have, um, the Doctor and Craig going to a, going to a department store together, and there are cringy gay jokes. Okay. <laughs> it's not even, like, I should specify, it's not even because, like, I find them, like, offensive or anything. I mean, they're really insensitive, but, like, they're not even funny. It's just, I don't know. Uh, I do like the Amy appearance, um, the Doctor seeing Amy and Rory in the, in the department store and seeing Amy's billboard up, not billboard, the, uh, the ad up in the store. That's what it is. 
why is this even a Cyberman story? It's ridiculous. They, they don't need to be here. <laughs> why is this even a story? I, w- I was going to say, you don't need the Cyberman here. You can have any stock alien race. But nope, uh, I don't think you even need this story. It, just, it doesn't need to exist. Uh, the doctor talking to Alfie scene is nice when he's up uh, up in Alfie's room when Craig left leaves for a moment. Which is the best part of the story because Craig left. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh yeah, then we have, uh, I noted here, the doctor contemplating death. It is a great scene, I think, um, uh, when Craig's holding Alfie and, and Craig falls asleep. I, I like that bit where uh, where the doctor's like, I'm going to die soon. Tomorrow's the day. And, you know, I, it, I think he plays it really well. Uh, oh yeah, and then I have Craig's opinion on the Doctor changes changes with the wind. It's it's a little odd because, like one moment Craig sees like the Doctor as, as as like the worst thing that could possibly happen to his life, and every time the Doctor enters, it's just the worst is to come. And sometimes he's like, "The Doctor is the greatest thing to ever happen to me. What would I do without the Doctor?" It's really inconsistent. Um, and granted, the the general opinion of the Doctor by the end is, "Oh, well, he's a really great guy, and he's here for Craig all the time." But uh, I don't know. There are some conflicting moments. It kind of doesn't make much sense. Much like all this episode. Then uh, Craig starts to get converted into into a Cyberman, and uh, that should mean something. It should mean more than the episode makes it out to be, but it doesn't. Because the power of love saves him, and uh, as, this, as he's breaking out because emotions, the Doctor screams, Daddy's coming home. And wow, that that just ugh, can 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 Smith not say that again, please? Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. Then we got another awful gay joke. Smith's farewell tour is apparently him just going around and buying people shit. Uh, continuing with the theme of the God complex of him buying Amy and Rory a car for no reason. Um, obligatory Stetson. Although to be fair, I do like bringing it back around to the impossible astronaut. That's the only thing I could really say. Like, as, as a general positive note for this episode, I like how it brings it back around to the Impossible Astronaut and shows us where everyone, how everyone got to that point, specifically the Doctor and River. Um, there is a nice little transition, though, where the, where the kids, uh, where, where, like, the Doctor, like, before going into the TARDIS, he talks to these three kids that are playing on the side, side of the street, and it kind of transitions into River looking into these kids' reports of, like, seeing the Doctor. So that's a nice way to transition there, and, um, and then Madame Kavarian kidnaps River and, you know, it leads into her being in the astronaut suit and killing the Doctor. So it's a cool cliffhanger. But, you know, it sounds really positive towards the end there, but that's only like the last three minutes of the episode. There's not much there to it, and there's not much positive to say. There's this, there's the Alfie scene, the Cyberman reveal at the beginning, all of which still have negative aspects about them. I'm going to give this a 2 out of 10, because I I, I really was going to give it a 1. And so far in this series, there hasn't been an episode I've gone as low as a one, because I really haven't found even the worst episode. I really haven't found something so bad that there are no redeemable qualities whatsoever in it. Closing time comes really close, but eh, it's not quite there. So two out of ten for that. Next up, I have the Series 6 finale, The Wedding of River Song. Typically, when I talk about the episode, I I say, you know, it gets a bit too much hate, but I don't know. To be honest, I haven't seen it in a really long time, so hey, who knows? I really don't know what I'm going to think going into this one, so um, let's just get right into it. And I just finished watching The Wedding of River Song. The concept of this episode is awesome. I I really like uh, the idea of time collapsing on itself and all the things that come with it. it you know like such as seeing charles dickens again the exact same actor from the unquiet dead which is an episode i personally adore um so it's nice seeing him again it's nice seeing winston churchill again because ian mcneese is just fucking awesome um and then the doctor's revealed uh, obviously fake beard uh but the pre-title sequence as a whole is cool i enjoy it um then we got a pointless dalek cameo fake skulls with a uh, with the doctor goes to see dorian again and um uh, there, there are like these fake skulls around there. They look really bad. <laughs> um, this is an episode where Moffat gets really caught up in his mystery box idea, um, which is a common criticism that we Moffat criticizers bring up a lot. Um, just Moffat and his and his obsession with mystery boxes and and mystery storylines that end up going nowhere. Although I think, to be fair, this episode has gotten a lot of criticism over the years, and I think it's been a bit blown out of proportion. 
specifically because like this is one of those few episodes that actually does answer a fair few of of Moffat's mystery box ideas while simultaneously setting up many more. Uh, oh yeah, I love uh, time catching up with the Doctor, as it's called in this, um, where, where um where the Doctor's called and uh, told that the Brigadier has passed away. It's a really well written scene. Absolutely love it because like because I like before it with the Doctor like kind of ranting at Dorian saying like uh, time doesn't catch up with me. Uh, it, uh, I I'm the exception, and um and then you know he's told about the Brig. So I really really enjoy that scene and of course Brigadier being one of my favorite characters in Doctor Who. Really nice scene for me as well. It just it. It's it's well done. And Matt Smith plays the scene very well. Also, um <laughs> then it's then, you know, it, it explains a bit more about how we got to the impossible astronaut, um, as he's t- as the doctor's talking to Churchill and um but I found it odd. Now that like he put it in context, the doctor's saying, like, Oh, I invited them because, you know, I want people to be around me when I die and you know. Um wouldn't the doctor invite more people than Amy, Rory, River, and Canton? I think that's really weird. <laughs> Especially because I'm not sure, like, if at that point... Oh, wait, yeah. Okay, you know what? That criticism is completely invalid. What am I saying? He invited them because they're they're the most current ones and he doesn't think he's actually going to die. Wow, sorry about that. I only just realized that now. Uh, I'm not going to cut that out, though, because I can't... Just to show that I can be wrong about things sometimes. And also, I'm too lazy to cut it out. I love Alex Kingston's acting when, uh, when she's in the astronaut suit and they show the doctor's death from impossible astronaut from his perspective. I enjoy that scene a lot. Uh, then, then uh, river kind of enters with this, um, uh, with her like soldier people and, uh, into the doctor talking with Winston. Uh, the doctor meets Amy once more and Matt Smith is really cringy in the scene. Not sure why he just kind of like goes all over the place, does the wavy arm thing way too much. Uh, the doctor tries to hook up Amy and Rory again. Okay. Um, and then there's more Doctor River, Doctor and River flirting cringe. Uh, I do like. Okay, so I want to talk about a bit, a bit more about Madame Kavarian because first off, I finally gotten past the phase of calling her Madame What's Her Face in her final episode. Go figure. But I I like that she remains unexplained because that was initially going to be a complaint. Like we still don't know who she is, but at the same time, it's like mm, enemies of the Doctor can kind of come from nowhere. And and having talked before in this in this rewatch in particular about. Uh, about Kavarian kind of like falling into that Pandora opens idea of the Doctor being a threat to the universe at large, it can literally be anyone. Um, so I do like that she remains unexplained. And oh yeah, then we then now, and to, to balance out that uh that praise, uh, even the silence are now acknowledging Rory's death, deaths <laughs> multiple. Like, it's fucking stupid. They come and they're like Rory, the person that keeps on dying or whatever the fuck they say. It's like. <laughs> I can't take that line seriously. The show is just continually acknowledging its own tropes. It's annoying. Uh, I like uh, Amy being being a cunt to Kavarian though. I like that she leaves Kavarian to die. I don't. I think I don't know. I I like that a lot. I think it's a nice bit of moral conflict. And also, um, she has a, she goes out on a cool line with that, saying that like River doesn't just get it from her. Uh, oh yeah. So here's where I start like kind of like raging at the end of the episode. <laughs> Maybe raging isn't the right word, but I just had to question: Why does River love the Doctor? Like, there's no actual connection there. And furthermore, than I noted, why do they have to get married? Because the universe says they have to be married, and the Doctor and River are what always together. Also, the Doctor's name isn't important. This is this is the start of that in, in the Moffat era, that, like, the Doctor's name is, like, the most important question in the universe. Um, yeah, it's just, why? Why does all this stuff need to be happening? These arcs mean nothing. The Doctor's name isn't important. The Doctor and River don't need to be married. There's no reason for them to be. Oh, but they had to make contact at a fixed time. No, they could have just touched. The Doctor showed that before. They just had to be, they had to make contact for that amount of time. The Doctor's death had to be enacted, and the Doctor was going to get out of it anyway. Nothing is changed by the fact that they're married, and they don't even act like they love each other. I don't believe it. It's... uh, uh, (laughs) Um, uh, I I do like the scene then afterward with uh, with Amy and River. I like that a lot when when River tells Amy about uh, the Doctor being alive, and of course for River it takes place post Flesh and Stone, so I enjoy that. You know, tying up a continuity. Um, let's see. Oh, the Doctor's surviving explanation is cool. I, I like how that's explained away, and I do like the idea of the Doctor wanting to start lying low now. I find that a really interesting idea that like he acknowledges that like he's too big and too important he's gotten to be 
I'm not a big name, but I mean, I guess a big name. Um, and he, and he wants to avoid that. And then, I mean, I guess it wouldn't be a Moffat finale if I didn't have to end on a negative note. Doctor Who being the first question ever asked or whatever it is. Like, just... Why? <laughs> why? It's not important! It's not... It's like just... Uh, okay, I feel like I just hit my mic. I don't know if I did. Sorry about that if I did. Ugh. So I'm going to give this episode a 5 out of 10, though. And 5 out of 10 is usually a score I reserve for really average episodes straight down the middle, but this is a 5 out of 10 for a different reason, mainly because it's just the amount of positives and negatives I have kind of cancel each other out, so I can't say it's more positive or negative than uh, than the other. So it's, it's a 5 out of 10 for me. There are a lot of flaws, but also at the same time, a lot of things I enjoy. And really, I walked away just wondering, like, okay, yeah, it's kind of bad, but it's not really deserving of all the hate it gets. I don't know. To, I, want, I want to start a conversation about this. If you, if you take the time to, I want to talk about this one in the comments. Just curious. I want to, I wanted to hear the perspective of someone who absolutely despises this episode because I don't know. I don't think there's that much to hate. I mean, there are things to hate and they're big things, but at the same time, you know, it's just a generally enjoyable episode. I don't despise it. So yeah. And really, I'm just trying to bide my time here because I don't want to rewatch The Doctor, The Widow, and The Wardrobe, but I guess I have to. And I just finished watching The Doctor, The Widow, and The Wardrobe! <laughs> Fuck! Kill me! <laughs> okay, um, boring pre-title sequence with bad CGI. I'm just gonna run right through this because I just don't give a flying fuck about this episode! Oh, God, fuck. <sighs> okay, Matt Smith is cringe. Murray Gold can fuck off. Those are, that's pretty standard at this point. This episode is not funny. I feel like someone had to read the script and tell Moffat that. It's not funny, but at the same time, it tries to be heartwarming and it tries to be a compelling story. It's not. Father death is well done. I like the death of the father. It's, it's well executed and it's, it's, it should be the backbone of this episode. Note, it should be. I admire Smith's cringy energy for such a shit script, I noted, and the line, because they're going to be sad later, is a good line, um, and the direction's kind of nice. That's about where the positives end. The little boy's actor, the little boy's actor isn't very good, uh, just another example of bad child actors. Not as bad as the kid in Night Terrors, but he's pretty bad. And then, Arab uh, Arabella, 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 bleh, Arabella Ware is in this episode. I love her, and she's just kind of in this episode to exist. Why is she here? Oh yeah, because Androzani reference? What? And also, I, then I just noted, I forget what this was in reference to, what is going on in all caps? And there are a bunch of scribbles here, because I just kept writing question marks after what is going on, and kind of trailed off into nothing. Um, the wood people costumes are God awful. They're so like obviously like bad classic who rubber. Like when their necks turn in, there's only like one or two moments where they turn in, and you could see the costume fold, and it looks really bad. And then I wrote a note. I also forget what this was about, and I swear I just watched the episode. Quote this note. Gotta be honest. Totally zoned out. Then the kids see the father's death, which is great. That's a great moment. And the father's death, like I said is the entire emotional weight of this episode, which is then completely fucking ruined by the end. Because the father survives, Murray Gold does his Murray Gold thing, the father survives, everyone's happy in the end. I can't help but feel like the episode would, would actually have some merit to it if they went through with the father death. Like, if he died, and you had this really nice scene at the end where the mother explains to her kids that uh, 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 that their father died and it's, it becomes a story of acceptance and it could still be a happy time because it is Christmas and it could be happy and whatever. It could do whatever it wants. It's a Christmas special or apparently that's how, that's, uh, that's how I'm supposed to look at it. But no, this episode is God awful. And, uh, then you, <laughs> then you get this scene where the mother see, uh, sees the doctor's TARDIS, uh, up in her attic, I think. And, and, uh, and she says some, uh, something like you need to be with your friends. And, and the doctor's like, they, I think they're, they, they all think I'm dead. Okay, I mean, like, it's it's a nice way to tie it into what's currently happening in Doctor Who, but what what's the the issue here is that this the entire special is completely separate 
from the rest of the show. Uh, like, as far as the story it's telling, the story means absolutely nothing when you look at it in a broader context in Doctor Who, but at the same time, it tacks on this really important scene at the end where Amy and Rory see the Doctor again for the first time in two years after last uh, having her, uh, seen him die and only being told through River that he's still alive. That being said, the reunion scene between uh, the Doctor, Amy, and Rory is a, is a nicely written scene, and it's well acted, I guess. Probably because it's the only thing that Karen Gillan and Arthur Darvel had to film for this, so, you know, they kind of, like, give their all here, so that's nice. But even that can't save this episode. I give it a 1 out of 10. God, I hate this one. Like, a lot. <laughs> Um, oh, and I'm just now realizing, I think, I think, unless I gave it, no, I don't think I ever gave it to an episode in the past. I think this is the first one out of ten in this rewatch series, so at least it has that award to go to it. And, uh, oh wow, I'm done finally. Oh jeez, I, I mean, next I have Asylum of the Daleks, but I'm gonna take some time off before I start the Series 7 rewatch, because <laughs> man, do I need some time off after this shit. Alright, uh, let's wrap up. So, what did I learn this time? Uh, basically nothing. Uh, not much change at all this time. I uh, It's just kind of me elaborating more on what I've thought of Matt Smith in the past. Uh, nothing really changed this time. Big thing that changed, though, I appreciate the Doctor's Wife a lot more. That's awesome. Um, I hate Let's Go Hitler a lot more. Actually, I hate, I hate A Good Man Goes to War a lot more. I used to think that that one wasn't so bad. Basically, like, I flip-flop my, I flip -flop my opinions on A Good Man Goes to War and The Wedding of River Song, even though I think I gave them the same score. I don't know. Yeah, I gave them the same score, but, like, I'm definitely more favorable to Wedding of River Song. Uh, kind of, like, flip-flop my original opinions on those. Um, Impossible Astronaut Day of the Moon, still a solid opener. I hate Curse of the Black Spot a bit more than I did before. Rebel Flesh and the Almost People can still fuck off. Uh, what else? Girl Who Waited is uh, better than I remember. Night Thoughts exists. Oh, uh, what else am I missing? God Complex is still awesome, and uh, Closing Time can also fuck off. Oh yeah, and Doctor Widow in the Wardrobe. Heh, <laughs> what an episode. Uh, Matt Smith as a whole is fine throughout this series. Um, he has his really cringy moments, but he definitely is a lot more comfortable in the role of the Doctor, and I, and I enjoy watching him here. As far as my opinions on Amy, Rory, and River go, not much has changed. River I dislike a bit more, but that's only because I listened to like uh, some River song audios not terribly long before doing this rewatch. I listened to series one and six of Diary of River Songs, so those being both really good, especially series six, kind of made me look back at really, really terribly written River and just like hate it even more. <laughs> uh, and Amy and Rory are fine. I mean, they they were never two companions that I was terribly passionate about, like, uh, a positive or negative opinion for that matter. They're just always kind of there, in my opinion. But, uh, yeah, I guess there's only one more episode of this to do. Of the rewatch, that is. Uh, we're gonna be doing Series 7, obviously including The Snowmen, and doing Day of the Doctor and Time of the Doctor at the end, so... That'll be fun. That'll definitely be the longest one, because there are the most episodes to cover there, and there's a lot to talk about in episodes like Day of the Doctor and Time of the Doctor. So, yeah, uh, join me next time. Tell me what your thoughts are on these episodes in the comments below. I know I know, Series 6 gets a lot of flack, especially about that halfway point, which I do agree more now that, that like it does significantly dip after... Um, well, I mean, it had already dipped at... Uh, at Rebel Flesh and the Almost People for me, but for most people it seems to be like, let's kill Hitler onward, that kind of starts to fail, but I don't know, I don't think Rebel Flesh, Almost People, and Good Man Goes to War is a good string of episodes. Good Man Goes to War is a bit better, but I don't know. So tell me why, I, I've, I've never quite seen like the the absolute hatred for these later episodes. I, like people kind of, as far as I can tell, like, people kind of start to realize that Moffat didn't have a plan at this point, but in my opinion he never had a plan to begin with. As far as like the 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 uh the larger story arc of the Smith era, so I don't know is is that it is it, is like is it only in halfway through series six that you realize that he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing, or is it something else that I'm missing entirely? Who knows? So um, thank you guys so much for watching. Um, 
Thank you for uh, for continually supporting Security Kitchen Productions, especially through this trying time of uh, dealing with COPPA and everything like that. It's It's been a really stressful time for us content creators, so uh, thank you for sticking around. Thank you for continuing to support my content, and um, thank you for watching most of what I do. I know I produce some pretty long content, I know my videos can drag on a bit, but um, I thank you, of course, to everyone who... Uh, who does stick around through that. So yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Until next time, this has been Joey Morgan with Security Kitchen Productions. Goodbye.